Greetings, friends. My name is Holly Taylor Kuhlman, and I teach in the theology department here at Providence College. I want to begin by welcoming you to this afternoon's session of the Humanities Forum, an enterprise here at Providence College that is now in its third year of existence, um, going strong, I would say, thanks to the good efforts of Professor Hain in our philosophy department. Um, I just want to say briefly to students, um, and especially those of you who may not even have been here three years ago when the initiative launched, it really came out of the desire on the part of uh, faculty and also some students to make a space um, outside of strict classroom experience and assignments and so on for conversation and for development of our shared intellectual life. And so many of us are really gratified to see this going forward. It's a special pleasure for me today to introduce Professor Marina McCoy, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy up the road, up the interstate at Boston College. Um, a former colleague and a current friend of mine, really um, I'm happy to have her here with us today. Um, again, Professor McCoy teaches philosophy, and she also teaches in the Boston College Pulse Service Learning Program. It's a very interesting and unusual program that looks somewhat like our CIV program, but also inc includes a service learning component in it. So an interesting combination. Professor McCoy is also a wife and a mother, and she has a very interesting concrete connection to the Dominican order. For the past 10 years, for the past decade, she has served at Norfolk Correctional Facility, a, men, a men's security prison located in Walpole, Massachusetts. And there, Professor McCoy leads discussions of spirituality, theology, and philosophy with men who form a formal third order lay Dominican chapter. Um, I, th I can just say, having been there once or twice, a service that those men uh, deeply appreciate. To have a visitor of that caliber to lead them in that kind of conversation is an enormous privilege for them. I think it's also interesting, this chapter is a very unusual um, Dominican chapter. They actually joke that they're the only uh, cloistered Dominican men, <laughs> community of Dominican men in the world. There are other cloistered communities of Dominican women, but um, cloistered um, through an interesting set of circumstances. Um, and I think it is experiences like that that may help you to gain some context for seeing the sort of questions that Professor McCoy likes to ask. She is author of a book entitled Wounded Heroes, Vulnerability as a Virtue in Ancient Greek Philosophy. She shows us a way in which we can come back to ancient texts with new questions and new concerns. And in that vein, she'll speak to us this afternoon on the topic of epistemic and existential vulnerability in Oedipus Tyrannus and in Plato's Apology. Please join me in welcoming Professor McCoy. Thank you, thank you for coming here on a Friday and spending your time here rather than somewhere else. Um, thanks also to the faculty for having me, to Raymond, to Holly, to Colin, I appreciate it. Um, so today, yes, I'm gonna talk about the question of vulnerability. Uh, to be human is to be vulnerable. This is a question we don't always think about, but one I wanna spend a little bit of time on today. As the words Latin root wellness communicates, the concept of vulnerability means to be capable of being wounded. Such vulnerability can take place at many levels. We're physically vulnerable insofar as we're liable to the effects of injury, illness, and death. We're emotionally vulnerable in that our passions can be negatively affected by events of ordinary life, and those passions can in turn affect our capacities to be good moral actors. We can even understand ourselves as spiritually vulnerable in the sense that significant questions of meaning can be overturned in the course of a lifetime as when we encounter the problem of suffering and question our beliefs about God or the goodness of other human beings. 
We're also socially vulnerable, being capable of suffering not only as individuals, but also as members of social groups that are marginalized or oppressed. Even if we ourselves do not suffer, when those in our society do, as beings who experience sympathy and exist in a web of relationships, those, the suffering of those in our own community can become our own in a secondary way. Thus, when we talk about the nature of vulnerability, we need to talk about it not only with respect to the possibility of individual suffering, but also with respect to the experience of the larger community. In the field of Greek philosophy, too often, this issue of vulnerability has been minimized or overlooked in favor of attention given either to the nature and acquisition of the moral and political virtues or by most more stoic strands of thought, even in those who are not formally stoicists. Socrates, for example, argues in his defense speech in the Apology that he cannot really be harmed by the Athenians, even if they kill him, because not only death, not only because death may not be bad, but also because the just life that he has attempted to live is itself in some way protective against harm. There is a way in which Socrates presents the just life as a certain kind of protection against the vulnerability of mortality. And yet, I think it is important for us to recover in, the Greek, in Greek thought a wider sense of the intellectual landscape, places where a sense that human beings can suffer real harm is part of our awareness and occasion for further reflection. So that's what I'm inviting you into this afternoon, and hopefully in our discussion we can take up some different threads of thought around that question. Now one question that might come immediately to mind is why talk about vulnerability rather than the meaning of suffering? And of course, in some ways, these two issues are closely related. And I do think that both philosophical and theological reflections on the nature of human suffering are important. But the problem of vulnerability is slightly different. Vulnerability as a concept anticipates the possibility of harm in advance, rather than only after the fact of suffering. In some ways, to come to terms with a particular loss or specified instance of suffering is difficult. But often, the concreteness of the event after the fact can at least partly be satisfied not only by philosophical reflection, but also practical demands of the situation. So for example, after the recent death of my family of my father, my first response was not to ask the question, why is there death or why is there suffering? Although these are questions I have thought about and taught about for many years. My first response was to grieve, to remember, to comfort others, to give myself over to the immediate work of being with people that I loved. Thus, although my topic here does include the value of a philosophical response to vulnerability and to suffering, I want to note the limits of the approach and the value of lament, care, community, prayer, and other ways to address suffering. The focus of my talk today is on epistemic vulnerability, that is, the ways in which we can be vulnerable with respect to knowledge. So I put on your handout for you um, a couple of definitions, just so you kind of have them handy to work with. So epistemic vulnerability means vulnerability with respect to knowledge, comes from the Greek word episteme, which means knowledge. And so um, here the problem of self-knowledge is especially acute. What does it mean if I do not know myself as limited? So there are many questions we could ask about the problem of knowing or not knowing, or the harm that can come from not knowing. But I'm especially gonna look at the question of what does it mean if we don't know ourselves, or we don't know how various aspects of being human are relevant to our own uh, vulnerability. So not to know all the facts of the world or to be an expert in all matters is one sort of epistemic limit. But the particular difficulty of knowing or not knowing oneself as limited is also potentially a cause of not caring well for oneself or in turn not caring well for the political community. Not knowing of our own human limit, including particular epistemic limits, has political effects on the wider community. For example, acting unjustly or acting without compassion. And so this talk, I'm just gonna look at two works, uh, Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannus with Plato's Apology and the following focus. Um, both these works focus on epistemic vulnerability, the ways in which we're not vulnerable to not knowing. Oedipus, as king, is ignorant of his own state as the polluted one of the city but he is also ignorant in a deeper way of certain fundamental truths about being human. Socrates in the Apology also takes up these themes of not knowing, both at the level of not knowing specific claims that one thinks one knows, but also in terms of more universal understandings of what it means to be a human being. 
That is, in both of these works, epistemic vulnerability is tied into a deeper kind of existential vulnerability. All right, so in Oedipus Tyrannus, the theme of knowledge is treated through the metaphors of sight, insight, blindness, and a failure to see. Oedipus is both the city's king and the polluted one, but at the beginning of the tragedy, he fails to recognize his identity as the source of the city's suffering. His recognition of his own identity is limited not only by the peculiar circumstances that have put him in the position of not knowing his own familial and political heritage, being exposed on a mountain, rescued by a shepherd, raised in Corinth as a result. It also runs deeper to a kind of ignorance about himself as a limited human being. Oedipus has a dual kind of ignorance. He does not know that he is the son of Laius and Eucasta and the origin of the city's pollution. But he also does not know that he is capable of being not only a king, but the polluted one. Capable of being not only clever, but ignorant. A person who possesses virtues, but also serious flaws. In Oedipus Tyrannus, this problem is framed with a visual metaphor that stands for this cognitive state. In the person of Oedipus, we find the question as to whether he is a person who can see or not. Now, as most of you know, Oedipus is a man who, unknown to himself, killed his own father, believing his father to be a stranger, and has married his own mother, believing himself to have been born in, in a different town with a different set of parents. His people approach him with an entreaty to alleviate their suffering, as crops are not growing and women are experiencing multiple stillbirths. The entire city suffers, and an oracle has declared that there is a polluted person who resides in the city who must be banished if the city is to recover. Oedipus the king is adamant about his desire to find this polluted individual and to expel him. He does not know the person whom he searches for is himself. At the start of the play, Oedipus has his physical sight, but lacks not only knowledge of his status as the still polluted one, but also knowledge of the complexities of human life that might bring compassion to bear on a polluted man. Oedipus is harsh in his judgment of this mysterious polluted one, demanding not only that he be exiled from the community, but also adding that uh, the man or anyone who helps him be refused even the smallest cup of water by any of its citizens. Even Creon cannot bear to banish Oedipus immediately on these terms. And if you know Creon from any of the plays like Antigone or, um, or the Oedipus, he's not maybe Mr. Compassion. So. <clears throat> At the same time, Oedipus has the counsel of a figure who is his inverse, the blind Tiresias who lacks physical sight but can see, who can know who Oedipus is and what it will mean for the city. For Sophocles makes good use of the dual senses of the Greek verb oida, as both I know and I see. So you can see that on your handout. It's just like when we say in English, I see, but sometimes we mean by I see, I know. Tiresias is more willing to see how things play themselves out and not to hurry fate along by revealing Oedipus to himself. Only when Oedipus mocks Tiresias does Tiresias turn against him and retreat from being his counsel right when Oedipus most needs good counsel. When Oedipus discovers that he, th that the polluted man is himself, when he's no longer blind to his own identity, he says, in the quote that's on your handout, uh, I hope, maybe I left that one off, okay, <laughs> just listen. Uh, light, may I now look at you for the last time? I've been brought to light as cursed in my birth, cursed in my wedlock, and in my killing. So he puts together this idea of the sight of himself with the sightedness of knowledge and longing for darkness. Later in the play, Oedipus blinds himself physically, right after he says this, but Oedipus longs for not only physical blindness, but also what it has come to signify for him. This d desire for ignorance of terrible things that he has done, terrible things that he has discovered and known that he cannot unknow. So we might identify in Oedipus three forms of epistemic vulnerability. First, at the factual level, he's unaware of his identity. That identity as the polluted one is crucial to the restoration of the city's well-being. He is unaware of his basic status as a native of Thebes rather than as an alien tyrant, as the son of Laius and Eucasta, as an adopted child, as a once abandoned child, and so on. A second form of epistemic vulnerability in Oedipus is his unwillingness to understand his own limits. He lacks a sensibility of himself as limited in his capacity to know, 
and a sense of himself as limited in his capacity uh, and that he can do harm. Oedipus conceives of himself as a person of wisdom. Having outwitted the Sphinx and saved the city from destruction, he understands himself as one who can use his intellect for the good of him city, the, his city and the good of himself. Oedipus fails to see his moral limits. He is not morally culpable for sleeping with his mother and treating her as his wife, since his action takes place in ignorance, at least not under most philosophical understandings of culpability. Uh, so the Greek concept of pollution or miasma can be distinguished from uh, unethical action in a more philosophical sense. But the situation with respect to the murder of his own father is more complex. His action is born out of a sense of his own righteousness and this other man's unrighteousness. Oedipus impulsively hits a man in the carriage who has acted rudely in his view, killing him. It's maybe our first instance of road rage in literature. He feels justified in acting in this way, not expressing any regret or contrition at the action, at least until he discovers that it is his own father. Prior to his knowledge of the identity of the offender as himself, Oedipus makes the mistake of identifying punishment of the polluted person with his own advantage. So this is on your sheet. He says, with justice you will seem an ally in battle, in seeking to avenge this land and God at the same time. Not for some off friend's advantage, but for my own interest, I will dispel this pollution. Whoever killed that one might also wish to kill me with his fierce hand. So helping him, I help myself. We can easily see the deep irony of this passage, because Oedipus will wish to use his own hand against himself later in the play, but he can hardly be said to be acting in his own interest in pursuing this heretofore unknown murderer. Oedipus's feeling is that he believes too easily in his own righteousness as defender of the city and the god's laws. He assumes that the city's interest and his noble intentions will always line up. And he lacks a sense of compassion or pity for the unknown criminal, assuming that an absolute opposition between city and criminal, a polarity between communal justice and the injustice of the murderer. Yet holds to an absolute opposition between himself as the just king and the polluted one as an unjust man. But the tragedy's audience can see this polarity is not so simple. Oedipus is the polluted one, and he also is truly the one who cares for his city's well-being. Oedipus is unaware of the ambiguities inherent in his kingship and in his humanity. He believes in absolute oppositions between the just and the unjust when a more nuanced answer is possible. On this reading, Oedipus thinks of justice and injustice as morally absolute categories in a world, uh, Sophocles' world, in which such categories do not apply so neatly. We can thus see that his moral vulnerability is also tied into his epistemic vulnerability. Had Oedipus known that the man in the carriage was his father, he would not have killed him. It seems fair to assume he would have been more restrained, however, not only to avoid the consequences of pollution, nothing so narrow as that, but also because his understanding of the man's identity would have been deep and beyond being something like that annoying driver who cut me off on the road. His father's identity as his father widens into a much larger horizon of what constitutes this other man's identity. It moves the man from being a tertiary, um, his other identity, father, king, husband, Laius, and not only an obstacle to Oedipus. It moves the man from being a tertiary figure in the narrative of Oedipus' life where this unknown man is simply an object and an obstacle to Oedipus's movement forward to being a subject in his own right. Thus, Oedipus's epistemic limit in this sense is distinct from just not knowing the facts about his own identity. He sees himself as good and at least some others as objects who support or fail to support his own life's narratives. And here we can see what might be a morally culpable form of epistemic vulnerability acting as though we possess an understanding of the whole of another's identity on the basis of our limited experience with them when, when in fact, we only see a larger whole. So, you know, the epistemic vulnerability per se isn't the moral problem, but his response to it, his uh, a lack of acknowledgement of it. Among the ironies of the play is that the man whom Oedipus views as deserving death is also the very source of his own life. And this is, in fact, why the murder is an act of pollution at all. Oedipus conceives of himself as a master of the whole, as the clever one who can beat the Sphinx, and as the tyrant who saves the city, but not as a part of a larger whole who can see and know only one part of that whole. 
And the third aspect of Oedipus's epistemic vulnerability can be discovered if we look to the riddle of the Sphinx itself and how Oedipus positions himself with respect to its content. One version of the riddle goes as follows. It's on your sheet by James Hecht. Um, There's on earth a being two-footed, four-footed, and three-footed that has one name. Of all creatures that move upon earth and in the heavens and in the sea, it alone changes form. But when it goes propped on most feet, then is the swiftness of its limbs weakest. So this version uh, appears on a black-footed Greek vase from around the 520s BCE. The answer to the riddle, of course, is the human being. The riddle in not only invites a solution to its puzzle, but also positively asserts that human beings are changeable and at times weak. Although the riddle highlights the vulnerability of the baby, or the four-legged crawl of the older infant is what the riddle points to, there is also the weakness of an aging adult, the three-footed one with a cane. Oedipus is vulnerable to becoming the polluted one precisely because he does not know he was that baby, a baby weakened with pierced ankles to prevent his crawling away, in fact. Oedipus does not really see himself in the riddle at all. He sees himself only as the solver of the riddle, the master of the problem's resolution. Indeed, he continues to act in this way all the way through the book, when the puzzle to be solved is who killed Laius and what the role of the shepherd was with respect to Yocasta's son. But Oedipus is himself human, that is, one who is two-footed, was four-footed, and potentially will be three-footed, one who can exist in a state of dependency as well as independence. Oedipus can see the existence of vulnerability in humanity, but he cannot apply this insight back to himself. There's a practical consequence to this lack of self-knowledge in Oedipus's part. His harshness with the one who has killed the king, his vows to exclude the man entirely from society are extreme. So there's a lot of work that's been written on mi miasma and pollution and what are typical punishments for this. And uh, he declares the polluted one may not reside on his land. He has to be exiled. And that's certainly in keeping with Greek views of miasma. And it's in keeping with the oracle, as we understand it from the book. But he also says he should not be welcomed in any land, not greeted by citizens, excluded from worship, excluded from the hospitality to wash hands, uh, water to wash his hands. Uh, this is work by David Constant, really good on this if faculty are interested. Um, exile alone was an appropriate ritual response to pollution. But Oedipus lays additional conditions, like refusing water or simple greeting to the polluted man on top of it. If Oedipus had imagined himself as the criminal, would he not have considered the possibility that such additional demands are beyond the requirements of purification? Oedipus fails in his exclusion of the morally weak, and especially fails to understand, to understand that he is capable of such weakness himself. This inattentiveness to his own limit is clear when he treats Tiresias so harshly. In his understandable desire to escape the truth of the blind man's prophecy, Oedipus searches for alternative explanations for why Tiresias declares him to be the criminal. So he mocks the blind Tiresias, calling him a deceitful, bogus priest with eyes for gain, blind, blind in his art. These are all translations by David Green, by the way. So, um, Oedipus's anger reaches a furious pitch and is not easily, easily extinguished. His rage seems to stem from a sense of overconfidence in his own knowledge in contrast to that of others. So for example, Oedipus is dismissive of Tiresias' ability to know the truth about his identity. He reminds Tiresias of his clever defeat of the Sphinx with his sarcastic proclamation that the one who solved the puzzle was I, unknowing Oedipus. Of course, it turns out to be true. He is unknowing Oedipus. He is angry, not only at the particulars of Tiresias' claims, but also at the idea that somebody else could know something about him that he doesn't know. One wonders whether Tiresias might have suffered a suggested an alternative response to the problem of solution, e less severe if only Oedipus had not unleashed his rage on the seer. We may not think about rage as a consequence of vulnerability, because the lashing out of rage has a false appearance of power. But Oedipus's rage is rooted in a failure to know himself as weak, and thus presents a false face of strength as a resistance to the acknowledgement of his own weakness. 
Um, so through these multiple plays on the language of knowledge as sight and ignorance as blindness, Sophocles communicates and draws upon a significant strand in Greek thought that treats knowledge in terms of vision or as theoria. For example, an author named Andrea Nightingale has argued uh, for this basic idea in her excellent work, uh, Spectacles of Truth. While much of contemporary philosophy treats knowledge in terms of propositions or verbally expressed ideas, Greek thinkers often rely on this common notion of knowledge as sight to convey their ideas. For example, Plato, um, if any of you have read The Republic, takes up this notion of seeing as knowledge in the middle books of The Republic, and images of the sun as akin to the form of the good or the journey out of the cave. And this imagery, in my interpretation of The Republic, allows for the knowledge of partial sight or partial ignorance. Just as we can see some but not all of a physical object, and so draw incorrect conclusions about it, our knowledge can also have such features or um, opinions. Epistemic vulnerability can include a failure to know the nature of others, the nature of ourselves, and the nature of the world as a result of being partially blind or failing to see. What Sophocles adds to this conversation, ongoing, I think, among the Greeks, is the idea that a failure to pay attention to our own vulnerability is not only the result but also the cause of such blindness. Oedipus cannot fathom the possibility that he is capable of being this polluted one. He can only identify with the kingly side or with the part of himself that felt justified in slaying the man at the crossroads or with his capacity to solve difficult problems for the good of the city. He cannot easily recognize the possibility that he himself is other than what he seems to be. That is, he does not accept the possibility of blind spots with, result to with respect to self-knowledge. This ignorance uh, of his own identity, by the way, uh, has another element, which is uh, there's, I think, a certain, I've just been thinking about this actually since I finished quite a, reading this, writing this book quite a while ago, but coming back to the text, um, there's a certain role that a community has itself with respect to his ignorance about his identity. So Oedipus fails to know his own identity in part because other people around him fail to disclose the reality of who he is to him. The shepherd who rescues him from exposure admits it to neither Yocasta nor to others in Thebes, nor does he even tell it to the second shepherd who takes Oedipus to be raised by King uh, Polybus and Merope. Oedipus's adoptive parents do not tell him that they, he is not their own flesh and blood, but deceive him about his true origin and all of its ambiguities and vulnerabilities. Thus, there's a corporate and communal cause of his failure to see and to know himself at work here. To the extent that Oedipus fails to know himself, it is partly because those who raised him failed to assist him in taking up any kind of engagement with understanding his painful, complicated, and vulnerable origins. Oedipus is not a person who is well disposed to encounter his reality because no one has prepared him to be anything other than a king. They have not prepared him to be not only a political actor and ruler, but also a subject of fate or a subject of the political community and its actions. This communally shaped ignorance is also, along with Oedipus's own actions towards the king and his mother, responsible for the city's pollution, then, we might say. As the events unfold, as Oedipus questions the shepherd, Yocasta, and others, we find that individuals who thought their actions existed in isolation from one another, in fact, jointly contributed to Oedipus's ignorance of his own identity, and so to his own epistemically vulnerable state. The herdsman regrets his pity, as you can see from the handout, says, I, O oh Lord, I pitied him. I thought I could send him to another land, but he saved it for the most terrible of all troubles. Oedipus then is vulnerable and not only limited in moral character, he is vulnerable to the actions of the community in which he exists. Each of the participants in the story of Oedipus is part of a confluence of factors that led to his suffering. That suffering might well have existed regardless of what steps he took to prevent it, and I don't want to undermine that effect of understanding tragedy. But in his and others' inattentiveness to the very possibility of these various dimensions of vulnerability, his suffering is magnified. However, we, the audience who witness this tragedy, are in a different situation than its characters, parallel one but with different choices. The audience of a Greek tragedy, which would have witnessed it in community as part of religious and civic life, can choose to consider in our community who among us is vulnerable and how our vulnerabilities and limits enter into the possibility of justice in the midst of life's woundings. While Oedipus did not find himself in the riddle of the Sphinx, 
we can find ourselves in the unfolding of the tragedy, not in order to avoid vulnerability completely, but rather to be better prepared to integrate its presence into our individual and communal lives. All right, so that's the first half on Oedipus, and now I'm going to turn to the Apology, where I want to point out some parallels and uh, we'll hopefully see some issues in common. So that's the other side of your handout. In Socrates, we see some significant parallels to Oedipus with respect to the questions of both epistemic and existential vulnerability. Socrates also embodies a condition of ignorance. He too is faced with the prospect of exile or death at the hands of the city, although for reasons that Plato clearly finds unwarranted. He is also vulnerable with respect to not being understood in terms of his practice of philosophy, that is, in terms of his identity as a philosopher and his deepest commitments. There's a, a constant effort by Plato, for example, to distinguish him from the sophists. Like Oedipus, Socrates is wise in ways that go beyond ordinary human capacities. He can ask penetrating questions and is masterful at reasoning. Unlike Oedipus, however, Socrates embodies a wisdom of self-knowledge that incorporates a sense of his own limit into a shared experience of what it means to be human. In the Apology, Socrates shows that the possession of human wisdom is a practical wisdom that allows one to act more virtuously in concrete circumstances. Human wisdom is more than knowing that one lacks a specific belief about some particular content. So it's more than saying something like, I don't know whether we should do the following action in Syria, you know? It also includes an existential and affectively appropriate understanding of oneself and others as limited. So who am I? What does it mean that I am a person who can lack knowledge? Such self-knowledge enables one to respond more virtuously to one's emotions and to others as well. And that is a, a dimension of the text I think that has not been looked at enough, but I will try to look at here. Socrates demonstrates this kind of human wisdom in the Apology. So in the Apology, Socrates seeks to defend not only himself against the charges that his practice is impious and corrupts the youth, but also the very practice of philosophy. So the word Apology, if you haven't read the text yet or discuss it yet, apologia means defense. So it's not Socrates apologizing, it's Socrates making a defense speech. Far more of his speech is spent defending his own practice of questioning others and the meaning of his actions in that context than, say, demonstrating acts of piety to a traditional Greek uh, gods in a way that could have cleared him from some of the charges. Socrates argues that his practice of questioning others in the city is good and does not corrupt others. Part of this defense of his questioning is to assert both similarity and dissimilarity between himself and his interlocutors, or and his jurors, the audience. Socrates questions others because they are ignorant regarding many matters, and in this regard, they and he are alike. He, like the politicians, poets, and craftsmen of his city, lacks knowledge of many moral and political questions. However, Socrates alone possesses a self-awareness of his own ignorance, while the others falsely claim to know beyond the true scope of their own knowledge. This dissimilarity makes Socrates better than those whom he questions and is part of his justification for why he continues to question others. Yet this higher status with respect to self-knowledge does not necessarily indicate a higher status with respect to something like being human. As I will discuss, Socrates is careful to emphasize a more democratic, universal aspect of ignorance as part of the human condition. His discussion thus moves between claims of radical equality of the human person, who all share this feature of not knowing, and special status for those who possess self-knowledge about such ignorance. So one question at hand is to clarify how and why does Socrates think that this form of self-knowledge is worthy and beneficial for life? Socrates denies his own knowledge in a variety of ways throughout the Apology. So the very opening of the book, the, the uh, dialogue, begins with a claim that he does not know, I don't know, ukoida, same verb that I mentioned before in Oedipus, how his accusers have affected the jury before reporting with irony his own state of being carried away by the opposition's amazing rhetoric. He then denies the possession of knowledge about things under the earth and in the heavens, as in the manner of his portrayal in Aristophanes' Clouds. He denies being an expert in human excellence or virtue. 
in the manner of sophists who take a, P, a fee, not a P, <laughs> that would be hilarious, that would be an Aristophanes. Um, in the manner of sophists who take a fee and purport to teach young men ex to excel, in quick sequence, Socrates states that he lacks knowledge of rhetoric, natural science, and the capacity to teach moral and political excellence. That is precisely the sorts of knowledge that the sophists might claim to possess. He then contrasts his own wisdom to the knowledge of others who claim a more than human wisdom. He says, I, men of Athens, have acquired this name through nothing other than a certain kind of wisdom. What kind of wisdom? That which is perhaps a human wisdom. I venture that I am wise with respect to this wisdom. While others may claim a more than human wisdom, Socrates locates himself within the conceptual space of being human, only human. This claim to human wisdom is contextualized with the contrast between his practice and what the sophists practice. So the sophists, um, in case it hasn't you haven't come across them yet before in your classes, are, are, were a group, um, and actually distinct individuals. They were not really, uh, in my view, really part of a school as much as they're often presented as being, but they were intellectuals who um, worked uh, on a variety of topics from natural science to rhetoric, but Socrates and Plato particularly take issue with their pretensions to be wise about human uh, political and moral goods. So. so rather than carefully parsing different ways that one can know or offering epistemological classification, Socrates focuses on praxis. Others might practice rhetoric or claim to teach moral and political excellence or investigate natural phenomena but if he knows anything at all, he says he has some kind of wisdom that helps him to deal with human things. His statement is also existential. He takes himself out of the more specific identities of, for example, being a talented courtroom speaker, expert scientist, uh, teacher, and asserts instead that he is human. He thus begins a movement in his speech away from particular identities that are associated with a technical skill and into an exploration of what it means to be a human being and how the philosophical activities in which he engages are intended to enhance his, and own, his own and others' humanity. Socrates presents the nature of a human wisdom as a kind of puzzle by introducing Chariphon's reported visit to the oracle at Delphi to ask whether anyone was wiser than Socrates. And the oracle replies to his question, no one is wiser. Now, before analyzing how Socrates interprets this reply, it's important to note a few features of the content of what the oracle says and does not say. First, the oracle did not say that Socrates positively possesses more wisdom than other people. She merely replied that no one was wiser. A more conservative interpretation of the content of this reply would grant only that no one is wiser than Socrates, but this in theory could mean everyone else is equally unwise. So you may have seen you know, commercials for toothpaste that say things like, no toothpaste works better than Crest. Um, they can claim that legitimately, even if they all work the same, which I think they do. The oracular proclamation itself never states that Socrates is uniquely wise, or wise in a way that elevates him above others. As an answer to Chariphon, it merely denies that anyone else's wisdom exceeds that of Socrates. A second significant feature of the oracle's reply is that it does not even make mention of Socrates. If we read it apart from Chariphon's initial question, the statement is only, no one is wiser. The oracle's statement thus also potentially invites an even more universal interpretation. With respect to human beings, no one is wiser, that is, than anybody else. In keeping with Greek practices that understood the oracle as a need of interpretation, Socrates weighs his self-understanding with the content of the oracle's proclamation. His hermeneutic is to assess the meaning of the oracle's statement according to how it may be made consistent with his own assessment about his actual state of knowing. While he never doubts the veracity of the oracle, his initial state is one of confusion and uh, puzzlement as he attempts to reconcile the interpretation that Chariphon gave to the oracle's claim that Socrates is especially wise and his own self-understanding as one who does not have any special wisdom. So this moment of aporia is significant. So I put this word aporia on your handout. And aporia means uh, not being in a state of puzzlement or confusion, but 
it comes from the idea of being without means. So uh, not having for us, not having uh, the means to, to go forward. So uh, it not only, so this moment of aporia not only precedes Socrates' eventual arrival at a satisfactory solution to the puzzle, which does eventually come, but also already exhibits precisely the sort of human wisdom that he is going to claim for himself. That is, Socrates is comfortable questioning the veracity of what he thinks he already knows about himself. He is willing to doubt whether his self-knowledge, so he's not wise, is really accurate. At the same time, he also does take seriously what he believes about himself, that he isn't wise at all in order to interpret the oracle's meaning. So he thus takes a middle position between both relying on his own current state of self-knowledge as the basis for unraveling the riddle, and yet also exploring the possibility that how he understands himself and his own state is not yet adequate. In other words, with respect to self-knowledge, Socrates takes a middle way between assuming his own adequate self-understanding and total skepticism about his capacity to know himself. We could say then that Socrates chooses to remain vulnerable to the possibility of a radical change in self-understanding, to the possibility that the schematic framework in which he locates himself and others will become radically shifted. We can call this a form of vulnerability insofar as the upending of cognitive schemas about oneself and one's identity are at minimum disruptive and uncomfortable, but potentially even experiences for fear anger or felt as traumatic as in the case of Oedipus's discovery of his own identity. While many instances may not be quite this extreme, human beings often protect themselves defensively against this form of vulnerability precisely because it is so disruptive, and Socrates does not. So you might think about, you know, questions of your own identity that have been, you've questioned maybe if you're a college student, um, the thing you thought you'd always major in, or who you, who you thought you were before you came to college, and who you discover you might be. Uh, and those can be wonderful discoveries, but they can be difficult discoveries as well. Um, likewise, we'll see with the politicians, poets, and craftsmen, they have um, a lot to learn about what they know and don't know, both about particular things and about themselves. Socrates discusses that his long-term practice of questioning others as a means to discover whether the oracle uh, could be refuted, uh, he begins by going to others with a public reputation for wisdom. <clears throat> While Socrates claims at the outset that his initial reason for questioning others was only to discover whether the oracle was correct or not, it's clear that Socrates rather quickly extends his own mission to include improving others' knowledge of themselves as well. He remarks that he tries to show others that although they think themselves to be wise, they are not. And he concludes from this experience, I am wiser than this human being, for while neither of us knows what is beautiful and good, he believes that he knows something while not knowing it, while I, just as I do not know, don't believe that I know. I seem then in this little matter to be wiser, in that I don't think that I know what I don't know. Of course, Socrates' additional practice of demonstrating to others their ignorance is hardly necessary in order to understand the truth of the oracle's words with respect to himself. His questioning of others also does not reliably lead them to take up the care of the soul. Socrates might well have discovered the ignorance of others and humbly and quietly walked away with a better sense of his own wisdom without showing others their own limits to the point of angering them. Although it is hard for me to imagine a Socrates like this. <laughs> Socrates' sense of others is more than a sense that they are epistemically limited or even morally limited. Socrates also has a sense of the value of his fellow human beings enough to want to care for their souls through this process of questioning. So this suggests that Socrates' wisdom is not limited to knowing himself, but that his growth in self-knowledge results in a concern to understand others and in reaching that understanding to care for them. Moreover, talking about how his interlocutors have reacted to questioning demonstrates to Socrates' current audience, the jurors, some of the moral implications of recognizing one's own limit or being unwilling to do so. Most people whom Socrates questions become defensive when they recognize their own ignorance. Socrates says they react by hating Socrates rather than attending to their own state. The bystanders who witness this process similarly come to dislike Socrates perhaps because they have some stake in maintaining the honor of others, or they fear being questioned themselves. 
I'm scared for Socrates to ask me any questions. So. <laughs> for the purpose of his defense against the charges, telling this story provides an explanation for the anger leveled at Socrates that he thinks led to his trial. For the deeper purposes of his defense of philosophy, Socrates provides a further lesson here for the jurors. Believing that one knows when one does not know has consequences for our affective and moral lives. So by affective, I mean emotions, passions. An inability to admit one's own shortcomings, including shortcomings in one's own knowledge or self-knowledge, often leads to falsely directed anger and hatred. That is, not being willing to recognize our own epistemic vulnerability in this more deeply existential way has negative effects on our capacity to relate ethically towards others. Socrates tries to teach the jurors something about this common human, human dynamic of response to Socratic questioning so that they might become more aware of one way of how the discovery of one's own limit can lead to expressions of anger or blame. Socrates, in contrast, is not especially reactive in the face of either praise or blame. Both when Caraphon praises him as the wisest of all human beings and when his fellow citizens express anger, Socrates stays focused on actively seeking the truth about himself rather than relying on others' honor or dishonor as the primary source of his own self-knowledge. Socrates admits to the jury that when he first realized how unpopular he was becoming, he felt grieved and afraid. It's on your handout, uh, I think, or 21E is the location of that if you'd like it. Um, however, his commitment to discovering the truth of the oracle remains unwavering. Later, he will compare his steadfastness to that of Achilles in his decision to remain at his post rather than flee the danger of death. It's at 28B and following. His steadfastness stems not only not from a lack of a strong affective response to being disliked, he does have all those strong emotions, but rather it's a result of his chosen reaction to his feelings of grief and fear. While his own lack of a good reputation among those whom he questioned, he says, quote, was difficult and heavy, 23A, Socrates bears the burden without lashing out at others. He accepts that he is affectively vulnerability, that his feelings can and are hurt by others' responses to him. Socrates feels grief as a result of the actual lack of honor, and perhaps also in response to his relative ineffectiveness in assisting others in their self-knowledge. He comes to recognize his practical limits as a teacher, and to this extent also displays self-knowledge. He is not in full command of a precise method by which he can unfailingly improve all those whom he questions or accompanies. Rather, he openly acknowledges the difficulty and sorrow he has felt as a result of being disliked and misunderstood while undertaking this practice. However, these initial emotions are only a first response to such an experience. Socrates willingly takes the longer path of exploring more fully whether he is worthy of Caraphon's praise or the politician's blame. His resulting self-understanding is neither of these two extremes. Both Socrates and those whom he questions lack honor in the eyes of others. Both Socrates and those whom he questions lack knowledge of the full answers to worthwhile political and ethical questions. However, if we trace out the long-term responses of Socrates and those he questions, we can see some distinct differences. Politicians, poets, and craftsmen react to their being shown not to know with anger and contempt for Socrates. They stop questioning, and then they direct their anger outward toward the perceived source of pain as a means of release from pain. Socrates' comparison of himself to a gadfly describes himself as one who is swatted at for the irritation that he causes, despite his political, uh, his potential value and political value in awakening others to virtue. His interlocutors, however, generally do not stand back and assess whether the honor that they have previously received is no longer proper to their own actual reality. They refuse to attend to the gap between received honor and whether such honor is deserved. They're not willing to engage in the discomfort of not knowing. Perhaps even more importantly, they do not understand that the source of their pain stems from a lack of fit between what they claim to know and what they actually know. So part of the process of arriving at greater self-knowledge includes recognizing that things one thought one knew about oneself might not be true. It's not simply the case that any given politician, once Socrates has questioned him, 
does not know as much as he claims to know about a particular topic, like what is the nature of courage. It is also the case that the politician once thought that he was the sort of person who was wise about courage, but now he has to doubt that self-assessment. In other words, Socrates' questions do not simply lead others to doubt the veracity of their own truth claims about particular matters, such as the relationship between courage and knowledge or whether a particular war is just. His questions lead others to recognize a fundamental problem in second-order judgments made about themselves, that they are wise about matters such as courage or justice. Socrates' interlocutors ought to be able to reconsider their own judgments about themselves and replace their false views of themselves with this more accurate self-assessment, but they refuse to engage with this possibility for more than a moment because of their emotional responses that accompany being vulnerable to self-doubt. Instead, they turn to their discomfort with themselves against Socrates. He says, those being examined are angry at me and not themselves. And uh, you know, we could um, think and even talk about it in the discussion if you want. There are ways in which we can think about this in our own political context. Um, for example, if people are defensive about whether uh, racism is at work or uh, defensive about particular political views or questions that they hold dear and are not willing to question on any side of the political spectrum. Um, there, we, we find that, I think, in a lot of political discussions that are happening today, a kind of entrenchment of views where there's not a willingness to dismantle the um, uh, questions about self-knowledge that accompany the particular claims that we make about particular concepts. All right. If we recall Socrates' own prior description of the puzzlement in response to the oracle's declaration that no one is wiser, we see that there is an alternative response to such experiences of epistemic vulnerability. Socrates also experiences a gap between his sense of himself and what others say. In this case, what the oracle says, that he's wise, and the sense that he's not wise. He does feel puzzled and confused because this view does not square with his own current self-understanding. But his response is not to reject the external assessment immediately, nor to accept it at face value. He spends time in aporia. He spends time staying in this sense of puzzlement, questioning, and even wonder and then explores through interactions with others whether the judgment is correct. And in fact, Socrates' self-assessment shifts significantly after this exploration. He discovers a duality in himself as on the one hand, merely human, in his lack of knowledge about the good and the beautiful, and on the other hand, possessing a human wisdom in knowing about such ignorance and recognizing the state of being human has its own kind of value and beauty. His wisdom includes not only knowing that he does not know about some particular factual matter, but also includes a sense of care for himself and what is human. Right, so in contrast to many of his interlocutors, I'll be wrapping up here in just a second, Socrates reacts to his emotional experiences of grief, difficulty, and the heaviness of the burden that results from others' judgments by reminding himself of his own limits. He does not attempt to bolster up his own esteem or honor in the eyes of others through some action that demonstrates his worthiness for great honor. Neither does he turn his hurt into anger directed back at those who are angry with him. Even at his trial, he continues to try to educate his jurors. Rather, he places himself on level ground with all other human beings. Immediately after he describes his emotional response to slander and unpopularity, he says, men, it's likely that the God really is wise and through his, his oracle says this, that human wisdom is of little value or none. And he seems to say, this man Socrates, picking my name, making me a paradigm, as if he were to say, this one of you, human beings, is wisest, who just like Socrates recognizes he is truthfully of no worth regarding wisdom. So Socrates rejects Chariphon's interpretation that the oracle was offering special praise of Socrates and instead interprets the oracle to be making a general proclamation about the relative lack of value of human wisdom. The oracle only used Socrates as an example of what it means to be human. Rather than attempting to elevate himself above others who criticize him, he understands himself as sharing a similarity with them. And Socrates seems to experience something like a kind of compassion for those who criticize him, in that he understands their lack of self-knowledge and hateful and angry reactions are an instance of a more universal lack of wisdom and a common reaction to that lack. If human beings in general are foolish, then the strong, unjustified emotional reactions of others towards Socrates make their reactions easier for him to bear. 
Socrates even undertakes a life of poverty in order to fulfill his mission to the god in caring for the city. That chosen material poverty mirrors his poverty in knowledge, as well as making it practical for him to complete his mission. Socr Socratic wisdom then includes, first, knowing that one does not know, second, having the proper cognitive affective responses of care to, of this state in oneself and others, and third, knowing how to make good judgments in particular moral and political situations as a response to this ignorance. So for example, Socrates refuses to drag someone off the street without arrest and kill them. He refuses to send uh, a ship. He argues against the idea of sending a ship to put some generals to death without a trial. So he reacts um, very cautiously uh, towards others when he doesn't know what other people think they know. All right, last paragraph. As mentioned earlier, Socrates does indeed suggest he is invulnerable to the actions of the jurors in some way. The virtue of his soul cannot be harmed, he says, not even by death itself. So there is a kind of invulnerability he displays. But this capacity to know that they cannot harm his virtue, nor deeply affect his capacity to live a good life, even if they put him to death, stems from a deeper acceptance of vulnerability. Vulnerability, it turns out, supports his virtue. Socrates accepts that death is inevitable and weighs death as a less serious harm than acting unjustly. Death is unavoidable, and so moral choices must be made within the context of being mortal and being vulnerable to that mortality. Likewise, Socrates' willingness to remain aware of his own epistemic vulnerabilities and those of others also prepares him to be a better member of his community. Rather than rejecting his own vulnerability, he embraces it. In embracing human limit, he gains a greater kind of freedom. As Socrates is sent to prison and eventually even to death, he invites his jurors and his city into freedom and into a more philosophical life. That's it. You know, I, I know you don't always uh, read the exact same text, so um, I can't promise I can speak on any text, but I am a Plato scholar, so <laughs> there's a very high likelihood if you want to ask a question like about the Republic or the Mino or some other Plato text that you did read, I'm happy to talk about those same themes and other things if you want. Thank you, Professor. So I think your speech is very inspiring. So it helps me to understand those ancient texts. I'm, not, I'm an international student. I'm, I'm a sophomore major in the humanities and theology. So based on the second part of your speech, so I think Socrates wants us to understand we are just human beings. And uh, we just know what we, we can know. Rather, we don't want to say we know those we don't know. I think I'm saying what I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's very inspiring. Thank you. Okay. Yes, so could you please give me some comments on my conclusion? Do you think I understand your speech correctly or not? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I try to make a variety of claims. I think um, so there's a couple ways you could look at. What, thank you for the question. It's an interesting question, actually. So one could look at this more uh, basically as Socrates saying, there are things I know and there are things I don't know, and I should know which categories to put them in. Like I have two boxes or something to put the concept into. So like I know these things about, I don't know, like my kids or names, you know, or these platonic dialogues, and I don't know these works by Francis Bacon. I got to put them in that box. But 
um, I wanted to say some other things about that, including the idea that um, not only are the things that we know, that we don't know, that we think that we know, but that if we think that we know them and don't know them, there are a lot of consequences for that. And one of the consequences is we can act badly out of those beliefs, but also we can not understand who we are in a wider sense, and so not respond to other people in the best way. So Socrates can tolerate a lot of anger, blame, discomfort um, in discussion and argument because he recognizes human beings don't really, are not very good at this knowing what they know and don't know stuff. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to say not only that we should yeah, correctly separate our facts, but that we should be comfortable with the idea that all the time, probably, we think we know things we don't know. And if we're not aware that that's like who we are, then we don't relate well to others or to ourselves. Um, my name is Alexia Patton. I'm currently a freshman at Providence College. My question is, um, is vulnerability a uh, part of the good, according to Plato and Socrates? Is that one of the forms to realize your wow. weaknesses and to, <laughs> uh, was he trying to help the city of Athens from their own corruption to realize their weaknesses? I'm just wondering, is that part of his beliefs, the forms? That is a really good question. So um, it's a complicated question because the different Platonic dialogues say different things. So there are some people who think that Socrates was really into knowing your own vulnerability, or he, they don't usually use that word, I do, but knowing that you don't know, and that Plato was more confident that we could come to know things through the Platonic dialogues and uh, certain methods he developed. And there's some good reason to think that. There are some dialogues that make much more positive claims. But I actually think <laughs> that even in dialogues like the Republic, where he talks about things like the forms, that he uses imagery and metaphors to convey the fact that we don't have secure knowledge of the type that we would say, say a doctor has or a pilot of a ship has, um, that the whole way in which we encounter the forms is through the imagination and through images and through uh, contingent lines of argument where you like start down one path and you kind of follow that path and then you see whether that path has problems with it or not, but you don't maybe see all of the forms in their total wholeness all the time. So I would say yes, that I think there is a way in which philosophy includes knowing, for even for Plato and his more developed ideas, this idea that we, uh, we look to, we see we do have an encounter with the forms, we have contact, but we don't have full access to what they are. So therefore, I cannot tell you whether it's a form of vulnerability or not. <laughs> so. Does anybody else have thoughts about that form? Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, the forms themselves should be. Uh, perfect instances of what are th whatever they are. And so I think you're right, that God should not be um, the God of Socrates <laughs> is not vulnerable. I don't think that's true. It's actually really, I went to a whole conference on vulnerability and theology in Germany last year in which the theologians were asking the question, can God be vulnerable? And how, what do we make out of the fact that Christ was vulnerable? Is a really difficult question because it, no matter which way you answer the question, there are problems in theology for you. But I think Plato's God doesn't have those problems, so the good or the gods in Plato seem to be totally whole and perfect, but we might be vulnerable with respect to what we can or can't know about them. Thanks. Um, my name is uh, Ben. I am a sophomore, and I was wondering if I get your thoughts on whether there is sort of a connection between vulnerability, especially in these two types, and uh, humility. Yes. So I do think that Socrates displays a kind of humility. Um, in my first book, which was not on vulnerability, it was on rhetoric, um, I used that word humility to describe Socrates' way of questioning. Um, and I got criticism for it, so I'll tell you what people, in order to show my own <laughs> limit also. Uh, so the criticism of that view is that um, Socrates doesn't sound really humble a lot of the time when he questions people. He sounds like he knows exactly what results he's after 
and how to corner the person into it. So that can look like not having humility. But I actually think in those instances that Socrates is not just trying to corner his opponent, but is uh, trying to reveal something about his interlocutor's limit or uh, to take one aspect of an idea and explore it and see what the limit is. Um, but I do think he's humble in the sense that he knows who he is and who he isn't. And so a great, um, actually a friend of mine and colleague, Paul McNellis at Boston College, has the best definition of humility. It's not in Plato, but he says it's knowing the truth and telling the truth about oneself. It's a sign of they're basing oneself too, little, too much or thinking too highly of oneself. And so in that sense, I think Socrates is all about humility. He's all about knowing who we are and knowing who we're not. Hello, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question that actually kind of follows the one previous to this that, that the young lady asked. Um, I just, I never noticed this before, but I, I was struck by the fact that both the Sphinx's riddle and uh, Chirophon's oracle sort of cryptically comprehend a definition of humanity mm -hmm. that's reflective, uh, according to your argument, which I agree with, uh, of human vulnerability. And I was just wondering if there's anything you want to say on the fact that these are both sort of extra human sources mm. that are becoming the, the sort of markers for understanding humans relative to their vulnerability. Yes, I think that is an excellent point, and I do think that is um, part of, of understanding the humanness of Socrates' human you know, ignorance or human wisdom, that is, it's set in contrast to the gods. So actually kind of like what you asked about the forms, right? I, my understanding of the forms, which is a really particular take on them, is that Socrates really, again, is in these visual metaphors of like, he can see, but not fully see everything about the form. Um, there's a kind of auditory component, I guess, right, with the oracles and the Sphinx's riddle that we can hear, but like, what do we comprehend in what we hear? So there's this need for interpretation that takes place. And in fact, I've been writing this book on the Republic, um, and I try to, to some extent, say these things are related. So I don't, not the puzzle question that you exactly asked, but the, um, it was a little nerdy. So if you don't, if you're not interested in this question, don't worry about it, my answer. But it's really interesting to think about if knowledge is like sight and seeing things or looking at something, and that's one way to understand that, you, that the better you understand it, the more you see about it, then how does that relate to how we say things? How does that relate to the claims we make about stuff? Because it might be that your language about things doesn't match the way things are or look. And I think that's something Socrates was really aware of, um, and was not, not unaware of, uh, because sophists like the Gor Gorgias talked about this stuff. So, um, so yeah, there's both a, an oral and a um, visual or theoretical component to that type of thing. <laughs> Thanks so much. Hey, I have two comments. Um, one has to do with the idea that you can be harmed by not knowing things. It seems like in ancient Greek tragedy, you often have the case that you get harmed by knowing things. So, pathe mathos, uh, learning through suffering, yeah. and that kind of thing. And Oedipus seems to be an example of that. So it's the the harm is not only in not knowing but also in learning things and learning is represented often in tragedy as a harmful process so there's that angle of epistemic vulnerability and the other comment is just right. maybe a, a philosophy or epistemology thing there seems to be another kind of epistemic vulnerability that is when somebody actually gets you to believe that you don't know something that you know, right? That form of epistemic injustice. In the personal realm, that's known as gaslighting, right? If somebody, <laughs> if somebody has, you know, a right. legitimate first person judgment of their situation and somebody's saying, oh no, you're just overreacting or you're oversensitive or, you know, you're deceiving yourself or something like that. In the political context uh, and in philosophy of science, we think of it as producing ignorance. So, you know, <laughs> a sophistic or a sophistical politician is imaginable who actually argues 
convincingly on television that what the climate science says, the scientist says is untrue, right? Uh, although, I mean, that's a form of epistemic vul vulnerability of all those people who don't know better, right. but can be harmed uh, by that sort of thing. So epistemic vulnerability can also go that way. It right. seems. Yes, let me take your second comment first, and then I'll try, <laughs> try to remember the first comment. Um, so the second comment, yeah. So I think that's actually a question that to me I would interpret in terms of the problems of the intersection of rhetoric and philosophy in the sense that we can be persuaded of things that are not true, or we can be uh, persuaded of that our beliefs that are true are untrue even. Uh, I don't think for Plato he would say if it's secure knowledge that we're going to be persuaded, but if it's a belief or it's a relatively justified or unjustified belief, then we can be persuaded of something that isn't true. So then the question is also like what does argument look like or something, which is a big, big problem. But um, I absolutely agree that there are forms of epistemic vulnerability that have to do with um, being persuaded of something that is untrue. And um, that's that's another question. I just didn't cover it, but absolutely. Um, yeah, so I don't know what to say about that because it's such a big topic in a certain sense, right? But um, I would say this, that one of the distinctions to, between philosophy and rhetoric is that philosophy seeks the truth in its enterprise. So I'm assuming that when people are gaslighting someone or are uh, denying science that is well established, they are doing it knowing that they're doing that. <laughs> and that is not an instance of truth seeking. And so in that sense, it's not a philosophical problem. Um, but I take actually Socrates' interlocutors to be a little bit better than that, actually. I don't take them to be people who don't want to know the truth or don't care or don't want to be wise. I take them to be people who can't tolerate the fact that they're not wise, which is a different kind of question. But uh, I, I take your point as being a very important one. And then just remind me, the first half, real quick, was... Oh yeah, so tragedy, absolutely. So I don't want to say this is the only theory of all tragedy. I'm actually really skeptical of any theory like that. I think it tends to look at one particular play and find out this, like something, a theory that works for Antigone, like Martha Nussbaum's theory about tragedy in Antigone is that you have incommensurable goods that you can't satisfy at the same time. I think it's a great theory for the Antigone. It doesn't apply really well to other uh, tragedies. So. I'm kind of hesitant to say, here's what all tragedies are doing. But absolutely, I think that uh, knowledge can, in the tragic sensibility, lead to suffering. But I think Oedipus is a particularly interesting instance of a tragedy in which uh, not knowing that you could be epistemically limited, or not knowing who you are, or not having a sense of your limit as a human being is part of what contributes to the fact that he ends up suffering. Um, and so that's why I tried to do these little things like, say, um, I didn't talk about it so much in the talk, but in the book I do look a little bit at like the question of miasma or pollution and like what are, you know, there could have been maybe better options for him. He didn't have to blind himself, for example. He maybe didn't have to end up in the state that he ended up in. And then in the book I talk about how at Oedipus, a colonist, actually uh, Oedipus is welcomed to the border at line of the city by Theseus. And so here's an instance of where the vulnerable, polluted person actually p plays a protective role for the polis and um, has a, another way that he can be incorporated into the city. So, anyway. I'm Caitlin Karen. I'm a junior here. Um, so, in the be thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I think the the or your original claim was that to be human is to be vulnerable. So my question is: Is vulnerability consistent with the understanding of the vulnerability of others? Um, in that, I if it is not, then would the understanding of the vulnerability of others be a sufficient condition to being vulnerable as a oneself or understanding one's own vulnerabilities. So let me just uh, ask you more about what your question is. Are you, is your question to ask whether 
um, if we know that we're vulnerable, we also will know that other people are vulnerable too, um, automatically, or yes, did you want to add to that? So is understanding your own vulnerability consistent with, or does it lead to the understanding of the vulnerabilities of others, or yeah. is it separate? Right, so I th um, think that it does, or can <laughs> at least, um, lead to recognizing it in others. I think that's what happens for Socrates anyway. So if I want to stick to, and let me think maybe about whether it could go the other way ever, but I think in the case of Socrates it does. So, uh, and it's an in so I guess what I was really interested in the text was why does Socrates put up with these people like so angry with him all the time, So he's so calm. And clearly part of it is he loves philosophy, he loves the truth, he's not so afraid to die, these kinds of things. But he also says he feels terrible about how people treat him. And I, so I was interested in how does he handle that. And so that sort of led me to think, well, maybe part of what's at work here is that when he recognizes his own limit, he has an easier time understanding the limits of other people. And that seems to me psychologically true. You know, it seems, for example, uh, like in a Christian framework, I can say this because I'm at Providence College, <laughs> to, uh, like in a Christian framework, it seems to me that if you recognize your own sin and weakness, you are more likely to forgive other people. There are lots of parables about that. Um, I think there's a, a different thing at work here, but uh, maybe psychologically, the psychology of the thing is similar, the sense that if, I'm, if I know my weakness, um, with respect to knowledge, then I can have a certain tolerance of that other people have that same weakness too. And even if I notice my responses to like dishonor are really strong, then I can be like, okay, I know what's going on when that person is really defensive when their political views are being questioned. So I think it can. It's hard for me actually to imagine, maybe someone can, but I can't, it's hard for me to imagine really knowing your own weakness and not being able to see it in others at all. I think it's a lot easier to do the other way. <laughs> People do that all the time. You're weak, but not me. But um, Socrates doesn't. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the very beginning of your paper that notion of Socrates being invulnerable in the sense, it seems, mm, you can't hurt a good person. Melitus and Anatus, they can't do anything. They can kill me, they can do all kinds of things, but they can't harm me. And then at the end of the paper, you mention that again, um, and you related it to vulnerability. Could you go over that again? I didn't yeah, quite yeah. get that part. Right, so yeah. um, in between when I first started thinking about, let me give you the genesis of like how I arrived at that. That might be a helpful thing. So in between when I first started writing on Socrates in other dialogues, not in the Apology, but um, and this question of vulnerability, I had some really interesting discussions with colleagues at other universities who said, yeah, but look, in the Apology, he says, <laughs> I'm not afraid of death. You can't harm me. He sounds really strong. He compares himself to Achilles. So I do want to acknowledge that um, I don't think vulnerability, so I guess really it's a question of clarifying what does one mean by vulnerable. And I don't mean by vulnerability that you can experience uh, suffering that will completely undo everything good that ever happened to you or something like that, right? So um, now sometimes tragedy does actually go that far. I don't think Socrates or Plato goes that far with Socrates. But then the tendency has been to treat him very stoically and say, He's just not harmed at all by anything that's happening around him, but that's just not what the text says. He says he was heavy hearted, he was sad, he gets killed, he clearly is not eager to die. He, you know, he accepts it, but he's not looking, I don't believe he's looking to die in that trial, I think he's looking to defend philosophy. So uh, what I want to say about that is that he does experience harm. I do think that he has the tools for how to integrate and incorporate it into his life but that doesn't mean he doesn't experience it at all. And another example would be Jesus. <laughs> so let me just say, like, he, uh, I love this about, uh, um, sorry to just keep bringing up all the theology, but I, he, he, you know, even the resurrected Jesus has, um, has uh, scars, right? And so I see that as a really beautiful image of a vulnerability that's incorporated into, so can we say, was Jesus vulnerable even though he got resurrected? Like, so in other words, people could say, I think incorrectly, because he knew he was going to be resurrected or because he knew God would take care of everything, he never suffered.
but that's not true, right? We, he genuinely suffers, even though it's redeemed. And so I think there is a maybe parallel type of way we could look at Socrates. I, I agree with you about the case of Jesus because he makes himself vulnerable, and that's the whole point. Right. But it sounds like you walked back on the claim of Socrates being invulnerable. Um, no, I didn't want to walk back on it. I Maybe wanted not, to but it sounded yeah. like you did. <laughs> no, I wanted to acknowledge a limit to <laughs> my claims um, because I, d I did think after discussion with this colleague, um, Clerk Shaw, actually in Memphis, um, that the, at Knoxville, Tennessee, gosh, um, that there is a, there are elements to Socrates where he is not as vulnerable to certain things like death as other people are, but I do think he is vulnerable to uh, emotional discomfort. I think he's vulnerable to all kinds of pain and suffering. He just doesn't, I mean, he, for example, he has to rub his chains when he's in the Fido. Um, so, yeah. But do any of those things matter for his eudaimonia, his happiness? Or are they just, you know? Right. So I think that he experiences times or moments in which he is grieved, heavy-hearted, unhappy. He says he was grieved and, uh, and heavy-hearted in the apology. Um, and so those are moments in his life where, yeah, he is vulnerable. That doesn't mean he can't find a way to incorporate it in a way that he can overall say that he lived a happy life. So I don't... I think you can be vulnerable and be happy, I guess, is another thing. I, I don't want to say that vulnerability means you can't be happy. I think you can be happy and suffer, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, let's yeah. Good time. I'm having a good time. All right, um, I just step out for a couple minutes, so I hope I'm not repeating any questions. Um, so just tell me if I am. So, okay, so I enjoyed your talk because, well, it was enjoyable, but also because. <laughs> Thank you. So, ev so everybody always says the, the little bromide, right? You're like, oh, philosophy begins with Socrates, blah, blah, blah. But nobody actually ever talks about what he means by human wisdom and like ignorance as being the actual human condition that you're living in. Like the only other. Um, person that I know of who dwells on that topic is Wendell Berry, uh -huh. who has a, a, he did a conference with one of his friends, Wes Jackson, called The Way of Ignorance. And his point was, the human condition is a condition of ignorance. So the way in which you have to operate is by, not, not by asking yourself the question, what knowledge do I need in order to make this decision? But seeing that I know that I'm not going to know important things, how do I act in that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's wisdom. I agree with Wendell Berry about that point. Comma, here's my objection to that. Good. Uh, oh, so here's my difficulty. So th I mean, that seems right to me in a certain way. Uh, but on the other hand, you get something like Socrates' statement in the apology that the unexamined life is not worth living. But really what he means there is not unexamined in the sense that in, the, in Descartes' sense, you take a moment in your life to step aside and investigate your life in the way that if you're a freshman in college, you're like, oh, before I declared, like, I. I stopped and I really thought about myself and then I picked and then I figured out what it was right. and then I'm set like an arrow for the rest of my life. He doesn't mean unexamined. He means any life besides the one in which you are constantly examining right. is not worth living because that is his life, right. right? The problem with that is the problem pointed out by Descartes, you're homeless, right? During that time of examination, Descartes says you're like, un you have to yeah. undo your house and you have to tear down the foundations and you're like living in a tent. And Socrates is famously jobless, homeless, and goes around cha like chastising people and exhausting them into submission that they don't know things. So, I mean, so the, the issue would be knowing that you don't know things seems like is, that's, an, that's only a good thing to recognize if you think it's actually possible to make some sort of progress out of that. If you have no assurance or episteme knowledge about m being able to move out of that, 
then I would say, well, that's, that's like really irresponsible what he's doing, right? That's like me looking at somebody's house and being like, you could build a better house than that, so while they're away on vacation, I'm gonna destroy it, and I'm totally doing them a, fa a favor because I raised it to its foundations and now they can build a better house, right? So, yeah. and, and you have, and on the, so that, and then one more thing and I'll be quiet. Um, and then you have the real possibility that people in not constantly reflecting on it in the way that Socrates does and forces other people to do by like imposition is something like the yips in sports, right? They might actually tacitly know what they're doing without having self-reflective knowledge and that tacit knowledge might not only be that might be sufficient for them living a good life and calling their attention to it actually might make them incapable of reaching eudaimonia and now all they can say is I'm going to redefine happiness as just knowing that I don't have happiness anymore like I redefined wisdom. Mm -hmm. Those are all really good points and I uh, do have a response I think for all of them but I so I think yes you can make commit I think the first question for me I sounded like can you make commitments to live practically even without having complete epistemic certainty. So one thing I want to say is to distinguish Cartesian certainty from Socratic questions of skepticism. So I think when Descartes talks about um, what it means to lack, to be skeptical of knowledge or to have knowledge, he has a model of knowledge that's all or nothing. Either you have it or you don't have it. You know that I exist. I know that I exist whenever I'm thinking something. And then that's absolutely certain. And he needs to have God be not this you know, evil deceiver so that everything can in a certain sense be given back to him in thought, right? Like math. Um, and so his model for what knowledge is, is like it, it's a binary on off kind of thing. I don't think that's Plato's or Socrates model of knowledge. And actually that was about my comment about seeing things that you can have partial knowledge or see things partially. You can see more or less of something further or more, be more or less illuminated about something. And if that's the case, then we can say that there can be progress where we don't say we've moved totally out of the state of ignorance or totally into a state of knowledge, but that we're somewhere in between. So I think that's consistent with Socrates of the symposium, for example. We're on a ladder. We're ascending towards beauty. We're ascending towards the forms, but we're not there. And I think one can and must make decisions or commitments in light of that understanding of what it means to be human. I do think it's a problem if you would we're one to think that you cannot make progress, so there's only the aporia, that would be a big problem. But I, don't, I do think you can make progress, and you can come to have a sense that you know more than you knew before, but, not by, but when I say no, I don't mean Cartesian, certain scientific knowledge. I mean something like better justified um, opinions that include a sense of insight we're seeing in this more theoretical platonic sense. So that's a long answer to part one. The second part of your question was, so the third part, I remember, let me talk about that. Um, of course, people can have tacit knowledge and to respond without having explicit knowledge because we do it all the time. Like, I believe the microphone will work or, I believe, you know, there are lots and lots of things that we believe. Uh, and can, or that we can have tacit knowledge of, which would be different. And uh, that's fine, that's not a problem. But when it comes to moral and ethical or political questions where there is significant controversy, then we no longer have reason to think that our knowledge is secure. So there's a, like a you know, social context for deciding what kinds of questions are things that we can doubt or should doubt or should be questioning. So it's not to say that everything has to be up for grabs all the time, but only that certain key kinds of questions are and must be. And, um, and th that actually made me think about Because <laughs> he did actually think that we can't know things with certainty. So he said, well, we should just take docs or opinion to be our guide. So there are philosophers who think that, who say, well, we don't, and, but the problem is, is that, the problem f for that is that we, could end up saying like, well, a lot of people thought slavery was good, or you know, a lot of people think that certain other morally popular positions are good, but that doesn't mean it is good. So uh, it has its problems too. I think I got most of your question at least. Again, 
you will have opportunity. I'll be happy to keep talking, though. To continue the conversation in the best possible way with food, um, you are all warmly invited to a reception immediately following um, this event happening in the great room. Am I on the first floor? Happening in the great room right there. Um, but just please join me again in thanking Professor McCoy.